We're talking about Christian worship. And I will confess to you right off the bat that as I have been working, preparing for this, it's always a lot more work before the first course, the first class rather, of course, because I'm reading all the background materials. And in addition to the books that you have there, those two books, I read a lot more. You know, a lot of other sources from different things. I've got books by D.A. Carson and a, and a bunch of articles and a lot of other stuff. And so I spend a lot of time getting ready for these. And in the process of getting ready for this course, probably more than almost any other, um, I felt the conviction of not really doing a great job leading worship, because I do it every Sunday. And I, I say that, and we'll investigate this book. We're going to be growing together, because again, as I have sort of immersed myself in this stuff over the last couple of weeks especially, but even longer, I've realized that there are aspects of the worship that I, in terms of of describing it to people, of leading people in particular aspects of worship that I've not been as good at as I should have been, or as focused at, or as, or as conscious of as I should have been. And so we're going to grow together in this, because this is a huge deal. Worship is the point of the Christian church. It is no less than that. Today we're going to do an introduction to the issues of worship, and then as we go along, it, uh, some of you have been in all the classes. Guillermo is the only person who's taken all of the courses, wow. um, and he's been in every class we've um, and plus, he took courses in theology in Guadalajara before he ever started this. And then he teaches these classes to the Spanish language students as well. So he, he gets a sort of triple immersion in this stuff. Um, he should be teaching. Uh, the, as we get into this, we're starting out with this fairly academic kind of general overview. And we will then get into some practical kinds of things. We'll talk about different styles of worship and, you know, um, and different people's understanding and opinion of it. But the goal will be for us to have a better understanding for ourselves, and also as we proceed in, you know, in terms of our lives and our involvement in church, and in some cases, in people's own leadership. For instance, this class, you'll notice that the, the designation on it is CL4. CL is our code for Christian leadership. This class is for anybody, and I hope and believe that anybody can, can benefit from it. But it particularly is oriented toward people who will be in some sort of leadership role. Some of our classes, because we have degrees, the Master of Theology and Master of Theology Ministry, are intended for people who want, who want to be in some form of ministry leadership. You can take them anyway. You don't have to plan on being an ordained minister or anything else, or a worship leader. <coughs> but uh, there will be aspects of this in which we will talk very specifically about how, how should we lead worship? How should we lead others? in this process in the way that is most effective and the most godly, that is most honoring to God and most beneficial to us, which is sort of Pope Pius IX's uh, definition of worship. We'll get into that. So that's where we're going with this. At any time, if you've got a question, you can ask questions. This, the, this morning, 10 to 12, we had our Christian ethics class. A lot of interaction, you know, and I, I encourage that. For instance, in that class, I put forward ethical dilemma questions, okay? Like the fat man conundrum, and if you want to know what that is, we'll talk about it later, or you can go back and watch the video. Um, okay, let's talk about Christian worship. I want to give you a brief history of Christian worship, because so many people think that Christian worship is what they do. Without, and this is one of the fundamental problems, the, the non-historicity of Christian worship today is a real problem, and we'll talk about that later. But we need to start out with an understanding that there have been very distinctive phases within the Christian church over the last 2,000 years where there were different predominant understandings of what worship really was supposed to be and how it was supposed to be done. And I start with this because it, give, it will give us, I believe, kind of a perspective on worship and maybe open our eyes to the fact that worship may not always be what we've been used to. And you're probably familiar with the term worship wars. In the, since especially the 80s and 90s, there has been a huge conflict, and it's been long older than that, between those who, are, who advocate for a more contemporary worship style and those who advocate for more traditional. You know, we're talking guitars and praise songs versus, you know, organs or pianos and choirs, right? Um, a lot of that's died down now. And it certainly didn't start in the 80s and 90s, although the 90s particularly was the time when it was the, the roughest in terms of arguments. Uh, uh, Spurgeon, the English preacher, in the 19th century, he called his music department the war department. 
because there was always a conflict over music and its place in the church. And so it's been a problem for a long time, but we make assumptions about what's proper worship. And maybe our assumptions about what is proper worship are a product of our ignorance, that worship has been many different things and has been appropriately and in a fulfilling way many different things. First, we need to recognize that for the first three centuries of the Christian church, this is up until Constantine in the early, uh, the early 300s, Constantine became a Christian and made Christianity legal. Prior to that, everything about Christian worship was countercultural. It did not follow the culture. In fact, it, during almost all that time, it was pretty severely persecuted. And therefore, could not be done in the open. It couldn't, you know, no sound systems. They didn't have sound systems anyway. But, you know, this idea of broadcasting and being loud, it was a much, it was different than anything else in the culture. It didn't go along with the culture. Would not have been recognized in many ways. One of the things the, the early Christians were persecuted so severely by the Romans is they refused to recognize the other gods that the Romans worshipped, and they especially refused to worship the emperor. In fact, the term atheist, uh, tomorrow we have our class on uh, apologetics too, response to the new atheism. The word atheist first became, came into common usage by the Romans in, with reference to the Christians. The Christians are called atheists because they didn't worship all of the Roman gods. So there's a very distinct difference between Christian worship in the first three centuries prior to Constantine and anything else that was going on in the culture. The point you may be seeing us getting to is, is that true today? Okay. Then in the fourth century, particularly the early 300s, Constantine becomes the emperor. He had become a Christian and so Christianity becomes legal and at that time the Christians started adapting Roman ceremonies into its liturgy with an emphasis on drama and on ritual. Incense, the use of incense, had been used with pagan gods for a long time. The idea of having robed priests, of having altars, all of those kinds of things that were adopted, all of them ritual symbols, of the drama of the liturgy, the processions in and out, and all of those kind of things, all of those really were adaptations from pagan ritual that had existed before. Because now the Christians were free to do this, and they looked around and said, well, that's pretty cool. I want to dress like that as the minister of the church. Right? So they adapted some of those things from the pagan ritual that existed prior to that. In other words, it no longer was countercultural. It began to take on aspects of the culture that was there before. And then in the 15th century, there was the invention of the Gutenberg Press. This is the 1400s. At that point, there was a shift in worship away from drama and ritual, more and more people started to learn to read because written materials were more readily available. And so there started to be much more of an emphasis on the written and therefore the spoken word. The word became, that is the words, became much more emphasized in the services because they were more readily available. You know, had they had video projectors and screens in those times, they couldn't have projected the lyrics to a song up or the scripture verses up and had some people read them because people couldn't read because there wasn't enough written material out there for people to learn to read. So a huge change. And then the following century, in the 16th century, the Protestant Reformation comes along and they push worship even further away from symbol and ceremony in favor of verbal communication. Part of this emphasis on verbal communication is because of the emphasis on scripture. Prior to the Protestant Reformation, this, the standard policy of the Catholic Church had been only priests and officials of the church, you know, particularly priests, should read scripture. They read it in Latin, which not a lot of people knew unless you were very well educated, and the idea was that if common people read scripture for themselves, then they would get it wrong and they'd be messed up. This is why there was such persecution of uh, Wycliffe and Tyndale, the early translators of the Bible into common languages, is because the belief that if people could read this by themselves, then they, they can't do it without guidance or they'll get it wrong. Well, sola scriptura was one of the great proclamations of the Reformation, which means scripture alone. That's our source of authority. It's not the Pope, it's not the magisterium, which is the authority structure of the Catholic Church. It is scripture. Well, the emphasis on that, the written word, was a huge deal uh, during the Reformation. And related to that, 
Also, an emphasis on the spoken word. Again, it started with the availability of written, printed words in the Gutenberg Press, but really came to focus in the Protestant Reformation. And that idea of an emphasis on uh, verbal communication, um, how many of you all come from a Baptist tradition? Anybody? Where is the pulpit in your church? In the middle. How many of you all come from a Methodist tradition? Where's the pulpit in your church? On the side. You know there's a big, re there are huge reasons why that's true? You'll notice our pulpit's on the side. That's, that's Reformed. That's Presbyterian. The issue is, what is the focus, the primary focus of the worship service? Following the Reformation, some churches, particularly the Baptist churches, and, and others, you know, not just the Baptist churches, but they're the ones that are biggest that we recognize most, there was such an emphasis on verbal communication, especially the preaching of the word, the pulpits were put in the center, because that's supposed to be the primary focus. Other churches, Presbyterian, Methodist, Anglican, the pulpits are on the side, because they believe while that's important, it's not the most important. What's the center of our church? Well, the cross and the altar table. That that's the primary focus, and it's only in support of that that you have preaching. Do you see what a big difference that makes? And that's why the location of the pulpit will tell you a lot about the historic tradition that a church comes from, and also some of what their primary focus is. Um, you know, we... Well, never mind. There, there are, the, 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 problem that, the problem that I sometimes run into when I go to churches that have the pulpit in the middle is it almost invariably seems like the preachers in those kind of churches, they have 20-minute sermons, but they take 45 minutes to give them because talking is the, is the point. You know, not, not the drama, not the ritual. Historically, the balance in churches has been the, the liturgy of the word and sacrament. But the sacramental part of that has, in many church traditions, has begun to go away in favor of just the word part. Or word and music. Okay. We'll get into some of that. Question. Yes? Uh, as a 15th, 16th century and through that period, and you've used the word teaching and preaching, um, could you comment briefly? It, was, it sounds to me like it was preaching, like this is the word. And it wasn't really intended to, for people to remember it and understand it. Uh, well, just comment on teaching versus preaching in that 15th, 16th century. Time. Well, they, there was, they, they didn't differentiate that to the same degree we do, uh, teaching and preaching. And I do think there's a difference. And I think that it's a lack of understanding that difference is why so many preachers are not really preachers. Um, that there is a difference in preaching and teaching. Um, teaching is primarily, and we had a class on homiletics, in, for instance, for preaching. And teaching is primarily cognitive oriented, it's so people will understand. Preaching, while it doesn't preclude that, doesn't exclude that, preaching is primarily supposed to be about heart change. All right? The perfect example for me in, in terms of preaching, uh, to give people a, a, what I'm, a sense of what I'm talking about, is the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's sermon, I Had a Dream, changed, practically changed a generation of people with regard to their understanding of the Civil Rights Movement. That was preaching. There was no informational content at all in that sermon. But, as I say, it practically changed the generation in favor of you know, understanding the racial inequalities that existed. Now, that does not mean there can't be informational content in a sermon. I think the best of sermons on, a, on when, you have to, when you're not preaching in the you know, Washington Mall, but rather you're preaching in a church Sunday after Sunday, to be able to have some informational content and some, something more than that. Okay, now... When I say preaching and teaching, one of the things, the emphasis on the Word also included much more reading of Scripture, which did not generally occur prior to that. Um, the fact that there was the advent uh, of the Revised Common Lectionary, or the Lectionary, which means that every week, and we use a Lectionary in our church, every week we have a passage of Old Testament, of New Testament, of Gospel, um, and then we will usually use, as a responsive reading involving the congregation, a Psalm or Proverb. Well, there was much more of that. Again, back in the days when people couldn't read it, they, frequently they couldn't recite it, even if they could read it, because, uh, I mean, well, Latin, they couldn't recite it in Latin, even if they memorized it. 
Um, so, yeah, it's a, it was a very different change. A lot more reading, a lot more preaching, a lot more teaching of the Word from the pulpit as well. And, there, and a big emphasis on teaching outside Sunday services. That's why it was the Protestant tradition that began to institute um, Wednesday night prayer services, Sunday night services, and that's taken many permutations in, in modern times especially, but much more of an emphasis on discipleship and teaching than had existed before. Um, it's still unfortunately true in many predominantly Catholic countries that people do not know the Bible because teaching the Bible is not something that is common in that tradition. Okay. Did somebody have their hand up? Uh, Carolyn first and then Lynn. Um, I'm going back to your first thing. For three okay. centuries Christian worship was countercultural. Was it based on Jewish worship? Initially there was a basis on Jewish worship, but that split fairly early. Um, you begin to see a little bit of that even in the book of Acts. By the 120s, the separation, uh, 120 AD, so we're talking about a third of the way through the process or so, less than half, there was a complete separation between uh, Christians and Jews. Earlier on, and the, the Bar Kokhba rebellion, where the Romans came in again, we think of AD 70 when they destroyed Jerusalem, but they came in again in the 120s um, with the Bar Kokhba rebellion, and at that point, rather than be beat up by the Romans, most of the Christians said, we're not part of them anymore. And that was the finalizing of the separation. But there had been more and more and more division between Jewish and Christian prior to that. But I'm, I'm talking about how they worshipped, though. <laughs> well, in terms of in the Roman world, uh -huh. Christians were in a lot of places that there were not Jewish communities. And so they oh. began to establish their own worship style, even in the book of Acts. You know, you've got them, uh, the description that they were gathering in people's homes, the fact that they began to worship on a different day. They started fairly early on to worship on the Lord's Day, as they called it, which is not the Sabbath. Sabbath... The, the Jewish holy day is Saturday, uh, which is why it's Sabado in, in Spanish. Christians began out of honoring and a desire to honor Jesus' resurrection to worship on Sunday, the Lord's Day, the day he was resurrected. And more and more and more, even in the book of Acts, we begin to see they were gathering in the porticos for teaching time, separate from the Jewish worship. They began to meet in each other's homes for meals together, for love feasts. Well, so very soon they began to be Still, a lot of them still saw themselves as Jews because ge genetically and even culturally they had been Jews historically, but they began to be something more than that. And then they began to separate more and more from that, especially as Gentiles were added. You know, the, the, when the, Christ, the Christian churches started adding more and more Gentiles, they couldn't go to temple anymore. Jew, Gentiles weren't allowed there. They had to meet somewhere separate from that. And then particularly when we say countercultural, the dominant culture of the Roman Empire in the first 300 years, the fact that through wherever they were in the Mediterranean <coughs> basin, the Roman gods, the Roman temples, the Roman culture was dominant, and the, the Christians were being persecuted by the Roman culture and the Roman authorities. So they very much were countercultural. They weren't part of that. Okay? So they separated from the Jews. They didn't fit in as more and more Gentiles became Christians, and they certainly didn't fit into Roman culture. In fact, the first major persecution of the, of the Christians, uh, the first one was by the Jews, you know, which we read about in Acts after the stoning of Stephen. But the first Roman persecution was in Rome when Nero was being blamed for the burning of Rome. And there, by the way, is no real historical evidence that he did that. But he was being blamed for it, and he couldn't, couldn't shake it loose. So he thought, the only way I'm going to get out from under this accusation, whether he did it or not, is find somebody else to blame. Well, he picked the Christians to blame and started a major persecution. At first, just in in Rome, he did it because nobody liked the Christians. Now, the people that they served, you know, the, the slaves, the women were accepted, slaves were accepted, children were loved, you know, the, you'd think, well, and that's the reason that it grew, Christianity grew so much. But in terms of in the Roman culture, Rome especially, the Christians would not go to social events because you go to a social event and it always involved libations being poured out to the gods. They wouldn't go to sporting events because sporting events always started with a declaration of, uh, of honor to the gods. So they were real outcasts in their own society. That's what I mean by countercultural. They refused to participate in any of the cultural activities because all of them involved pagan worship. The emperor worship, for instance. The emperor was always being held up as a living god. Christians would not go along with that. And so they very much were countercultural. Okay? Keep, we keep going. So you begin to see move away from drama and ritual and, and that sort of thing and more toward word, the words. Then the Enlightenment comes along in the 17th and 18th century. And the Enlightenment emphasized rationalism, 
rationality and rationalism. Rationalism is a belief that, that the, the reason is the only real source of understanding. Um, so rationality, rationalism, and ex explanation. This is where a lot of the big science boom came because the desire to try to explain things. Well, this led to the Christians in that time period really beginning to emphasize not just reading or not just you know having homilies. See, it used to be, I would say a, a homily is one, one half of a meditation and a meditation is one half of a sermon. You know, get longer and longer and longer, more and more emphasis on preaching. And so sermons and teaching became the primary purposes of worship. It no longer was celebration of the mystery of Christ, the Paschal ministry, uh, or mystery, I'm sorry, of, of the, the sacrifice that Christ celebrated at the sacrament table, the altar table. Uh, remember, remember what altars were originally intended for? To sacrifice animals. When we have an altar table, it's because early on that was to symbolize the Paschal sacrifice, you know, the, the, uh, the sacrifice of Christ. A move away from that and more and more and more towards sermons and teaching being the primary reason people got together. We still, you know, for a lot of people, we still have maintained that. I, I had somebody say to me too long ago that talking about a relation of theirs that comes to church. And, you know, she said, well, the reason we come here is so we can hear you preach. And I went, ooh, that's not really the reason we should be here. That's not the primary focus. And yet a lot of people think that way. But in a lot of churches where contemporary music and contemporary uh, worship style is there, they think they come to sing, to worship. In fact, worship has become synonymous with the singing part. You know, I had a good friend who was part of a worship team. Well, that meant musicians. Okay. A complete, and I'm going to talk, that's something we're going to get into a lot, is what's, where, where's the balance in that? How much of that is appropriate? Have we gone too far in places? What do we need to recover? Then, so everything is very rational during the Enlightenment. Very word-oriented, sermon-oriented, explanation-oriented. Then we get to the 19th century Romantic movement. This is the Romantic poets, um, you know, the, the, in England and some in Germany, we had the uh, Ger Germanic uh, Romance movement. This reintroduced the idea of emotion. The Romantic poets are all about emotion. They're about love, and they're about beauty, and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So they brought emotion back into it, not just rationality, and that's where we begin to get revivalism, the revival movements, where there was much more of an emphasis on singing, on fervent preaching, and on invitation to conversion. This is, it was out of this movement in England that all of the whole tent revival thing started. There were revivalist movements following the Romantic movement in England that, that much more emotion, much more raising of the hands, much more singing loud praises, much more you know, hellfire and brimstone kind of preaching and calling for people to, to you know, to reconvert, convert or reconvert. So much more emotionalism. Do you begin to see how these things have been, you know, sequences of events in time? We make the assumption that certain things have always existed. I'm sure, I come from the South, and I know that all of the people who go to the churches or go to the tent revivals, you still have tent revival meetings that pass through on a regular basis, they must think, you know, unless they've studied this, it's always been like this. Well, it's only been like that for the last couple hundred years. And it was brand new, following the Romantic movement, that that sort of stuff started. And then, what has sometimes been called the, the Great Worship <coughs> Awakening by some people, and that tells you where they're coming from, in the 1960s, music takes over as center stage. There had always been, you know, from the, from the revivalist movement of uh, the post-Romantic period, there had always been more singing. You know, there wasn't congregational singing for centuries in the Christian church, okay? You would have organ, you would have a choir singing, you know, whether it be Gregorian chants or whatever. These are not something that the, that the congregation sang along with, all right? That's, they didn't used to do that. Well, in the 1960s, music takes the center stage, and it becomes the primary form of communication uh, church communication and worship. Like I say, the worship, you know, to, wor to worship means to sing in a lot of contemporary churches, the worship band. Especially there's, there was a new emphasis on contemporary music, starting out as sort of folk music, you know, uh, acoustic guitars and that sort of thing, and then moving toward electrified instruments and electrified keyboards and even drums. Um, and people feel very strongly about those things. 
we had a we had a worship band as part of our Spanish. In fact, if you want to see the difference in these, then you can come to our English language congregation and then come to our Spanish language congregation here at Lakeside. Um, and very, very different. Well, when, when they first brought in the set of drums that they were going to use in the Spanish language congregation, one of the older women in our church, who comes from much more of a, you know, sort of fervent kind of background, I think, she said, oh, great, we're going to start using drums. And another woman who comes from a very different tradition, who's about the same age, said, we start banging on those drums and I'm out of here. <laughs> People feel very differently about that. Now, so... And in addition, the music was reflective of the fact that worship became a much more personal activity. Less of a communal activity, although you do it together. Much more about me worshiping God, me raising my hands, me singing, me feeling that connection with God. And it is an enthusiastic, personal experience of worship was the focus of that. Which would have been completely foreign to a church 500 years earlier. The idea that you come and you worship, it's about you having a worship experience of God instead of the community having a worship experience of God, will be a very different thing. And then today, today we have almost got past a lot of the worship war kind of arguments. And a lot of churches are offering multiple services, some of them contemporary, some of them traditional. Some are blended. Our English language service, in fact, the hymnal that we use is called Worship and Rejoice, and we picked it because of all the sort of traditionally oriented hymnals, it has more contemporary worship songs in it than any other hymnal we could find. Some churches have two hymnals. You know, or they'll have a hymnal and a songbook. All right? One traditional, one contemporary. Um, but today, you, you can still have pipe organs and choirs, and electrified instruments and drums, and multimedia presentations, and video projectors, interpretive dance, drama, and on and on. For somebody to be a worship director at a large church today, you've got to be a jack of all trades. You've got to know the electronics. You've got to understand, you know, both tradition, if, if you're good at it, traditional and contemporary music styles. You've got to know how to direct music. You've got to know how to lead groups. I mean, it, uh, you've got to understand how to do PowerPoint presentations. You've got to, if, and on and on. It's very complicated. Now, many people have applauded the changes that have occurred since the 60s. And again, 80s and 90s. And it began in North America, in the US, and also simultaneously, or about the same time, in New Zealand and Australia. In fact, the most well-known of the contemporary Christian music um, production companies right now is Hillsong Music, which is out of Australia. Australia and New Zealand. Um, and so there's, there's been a lot of emphasis from down under with regard to the modern contemporary music. And as I say, some people have referred to that as the great worship awakening. Various people have had various opinions about that. Uh, some people have said, well, a musical style is like a language. And in the same way that Martin Luther translated the Bible into G German, and in, in the process, by the way, invented modern German as opposed to old German, um, he was translating into language people could understand. Well, contemporary music is another kind of language, and we're translating it into a music into a language that people can understand today. But is translation all that has occurred? A lot of people have said that well, all we've done is we've traded pipe organs or grand pianos for guitars. It's just a trade. The there's no real difference between them. It's just a style. Well. Is it possible, and this is something that, this is not the primary focus of our class, but it's a question we're going to be asking as we go along, because we're going to be talking about what is real worship, what is, what is the best kind of worship. Is it possible that not just the style, but the actual content and shape of modern Christian worship has been affected by the different forms that have been adopted? My undergraduate degree is in communication, primarily theory. You know, it's not like media mass media communication so much as it is theory communication. Marshall McLuhan, one of the most important of the communication theorists in history, had a very famous saying. He said, the medium is the message. In other words, the medium that you use for communicating itself is one of the major factors in what the message is, what it conveys, what the content is. You change the medium, and you really do change the content of the message. That's a basic accepted premise in communication <coughs> theory. Well, we, we fundamentally change the medium, if you will, 
the, the, the way in which worship was done when we changed to a, many churches changed to a more contemporary style. So have we in some way changed the content as well, or is that completely neutral? Is it, is it, a new, is it really a neutral issue? It's a question we need to ask. There's an old um, Latin saying, lex orandi, lex credenti, lex vivendi. What that means is, as you worship, so you will believe. As you believe, so you will live. How we worship affects our beliefs. And what we believe affects how we live. So it's all a package. And the interesting thing is that a lot of study has been done about, um, if, are we just believing the same thing and expressing it in a different way? Or by expressing it in a different way, are we changing what we believe? That's the Marshall McLuhan kind of question. Uh, there's a philosopher at Calvin College named James K. A. Smith. He has focused his, a lot of his research and writing on the idea that human beings are more lovers than they are thinkers or even than they are believers. In other words, the things that, that we love, the things that drive our affections really lead us more than decisions we make and more than doctrines we believe in. What his research has suggested, and a lot of people have agreed with this, is that how we do things, how we worship, for instance, will determine what we believe. Much more so than us deciding what we believe, determining how we worship. And if that's true, then how we worship makes a huge difference in terms of our beliefs. I would go so far as to say that, and, I, and I'm not just saying this, a lot of contemporary Christian worship leaders and pastors of, of large churches that do contemporary Christian worship are beginning to think and write that we may have lost something very important here. That the style of worship that so many of us are pursuing now has no valid theological foundation. In fact, there's one young worship leader, and I'm, I think I'm going to duplicate this article and distribute it because it's free online anyway, so I don't think I'm violating anything. I'll just we'll, figure that. we'll figure that out. <laughs> um, and he's from that style. I mean, he grew up with it. He said, I've never known anything else. But he said, I'm begin beginning to realize that worship cannot be based upon what you find most comfortable, but must be based upon what you believe. We must allow our doctrine to determine our worship, not the other way around. And he said, and I'm figuring out as one who's done that, that we are letting the other thing happen. That our worship style is dictating our doctrine. Um, I had somebody personally say to me recently, um, yeah, I really can't come to your church because your music is so boring. <laughs> What's the theological foundation for that? When somebody says your music is boring, somebody else finds it very worshipful. What does that mean in terms of our priorities, our orientation? There's been more and more the... And, and there are others who say, I can't go to that church, that other church, because it's too loud. Yeah, because it's too loud. Exactly. You know, you start banging on those drums, I'm out of here. Exactly. It reminds me of that uh, the Whoopi Goldberg movie where he goes into this bar and these two bikers look at each other and go, if this turns into a nun bar, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. <laughs> Well, some people feel that way about the music in the church, okay? Um, people feel very strongly about that. And yet, should we be primarily motivated by what we find most, what's the word I should use? Entertaining? Yeah. Gratifying? Pleasing? Where is the aspect of us being willing to come and present ourselves as a living sacrifice because the sacrifice Christ has made for us? I'm not even willing to listen to your boring music. So much for me making myself a sacrifice because of the sacrifice of Christ. You see where, what I mean? And, I, and I'm, not being, I'm not being condemning of the contemporary Christian music. I, in fact, think that the, the idea of... Paul said, I become all things to all men, that by all means I might save some. I think that our goal is to try to reach as many people as we can, but what are we prepared to give away in favor of that? I believe it is a fact, and I say this because a lot more contemporary Christian music leaders and pastors are beginning to say this, that in the process of us trying to reach more people, we may have thrown the baby out in the bathwater with the bathwater in the sense that we have become more culturally driven than we are Christ-driven. 
what will the culture find acceptable and attractive and entertaining? And it's human nature to want to be entertained. You know. Have we given away too much of the doctrine of what it means to be Christians in worship in favor of being entertaining so more people will come? Have we in the process created a culture of celebrity for those people who, you know, I've noticed that in pictures and videos and, I, you know, a lot of things we've seen, and where you have worship bands, and the worship bands are up there, you know, and, and they're singing and they're praising. I don't think I've ever seen an ugly girl doing that up in front of a big crowd of people. Right? They're always gorgeous. Maybe God made them pretty I, for that reason. I don't know. Or, or a big man. Or big, you know, well, um, and I've, we've been to, I've been, we've been to some very satisfying and very Christian music. We almost always were here on Sunday, but the last time that we were in San Antonio and went for, um, to, to bring some things back for, for school, um, we were able to go to the, the church that Max Lucado is one of the ministers at, and he spoke. Well, before that, they had a long period of music and worship, etc., and I found that terrifically satisfying. Okay? It was great. At one point here, I was thinking that we, you know, we might want to have, we're growing, you know, um, that we might want to have a contemporary Christian service, contemporary music service, or contemporary worship service, in addition to our more traditional service, in order to attract more people. Well, the more and more I get into this, the more I'm sort of saying, am I just giving into that whole sort of mall mentality about give them what they want? Open a new shop that will have stuff they want, rather than make them understand why what's being offered is what they need. Do you see the struggle with this? And it is about worship. Yes? Uh, something that I have found out personally is that uh, music, uh, there are some songs, contemporary or hymns, that just move me and cause me to be centered on the Lord. So whether it be contemporary or traditional, uh, a mixture of both I think is good because it it addresses you know the, the entire congregation. Right. Uh, I, but for me, I, I just think worship uh, what brings you what brings you into God's presence, what moves your heart uh, to worship Him and. Sometimes it begins with music or reading of the word, uh, and and I think it, different people are moved in different ways. Well, I, I agree with that, and I often you know will, will comment after we sing a song you know that I find it moving or you know mm -hmm. I sing this song and I'm back in the hymn at a Baptist church when I was 16 years old getting saved or whatever it was. Uh, so I feel that too, and yet. Well, I agree with that. To what extent is that emotionalism a false trail? Mm -hmm. Do we have to feel emotion in order to worship God? So one of the reasons that I started with this is early on in the Christian church, after the sort of countercultural, after, after it was legal, at first they saw ritual and the drama as being the focal point. There wasn't a lot of, there wasn't emotionalism in it. There was a sense of participating in something bigger than yourself. And then we went through a period of time where it was very intellectual, it was very cognitive. The focus was on the word and on, you know, hearing the word spoken and the, the instruction of sermons. And only fairly late in our history as Christians, as the church, have we gotten to the point of emotionalism, actually only since the Romantic movement, where emotion, and then we've sort of refined that into emotion that is music-led primarily, is what we perceive of as real worship. And so one of the reasons I start with this is because we need to understand that we, I'm not saying that that's wrong, I'm just saying we need to understand that there's a balance in there because it's only been for a relatively short part of our history as a Christian faith that emotion was seen as being a primary component of what it meant to worship. Okay, is that fair? Now where's the balance? That's part of what we're going to investigate. Yes? Okay, I guess um, I'm thinking too that a relationship with Jesus is you know mental ascent, um, heart knowledge, um, but it's emotional. I mean, how can you not love Jesus and not be emotional? I mean, he is 
he's everything. He is everything you could ever want and or need. And that's an, that's an emotion. Well, some, so, I don't disagree with that at all. And yet some people would not feel that in the same way. And if they don't feel it in the same way, they don't feel emotion in the same way. Um, and sometimes emotions fail you. And sometimes emotions fail you. Does that? Uh, yes. When it, it, and here's, here's one of the problems. For some people, when it stops feeling good, they think there's something wrong with it or with me. I have, I theologically, I do not have a problem with the charismatic or Pentecostal movement. Paul was very clear that the gifts of the Holy Spirit, including the more ecstatic ones, speaking in tongues, etc., are real. I don't have a problem with that. The problem I have, I've had a number of friends who were part of the charismatic movement uh, and involved in worship bands too. And for them, I recognized in them that it became their expectations for the next experience of worship was for the next experience of emotional high. What's the next thrill? that yes. we can feel. And, and there's a danger in that in the charismatic movement. I don't think theologically it's wrong, but there is an inherent danger. Well, is there perhaps the same danger when we're looking for the next emotional experience of Jesus when we don't feel it? Does that mean that the cognitive recognition, the participation in the sacrifice, all the rest of what historically we have known to be worship, that it's not valid if we don't feel the emotion of it? You see why I'm asking these questions, and they are yes. questions. Joanne. I, you know, I heard a lecture, one of the lectures, more than one of my pastors, when I rededicated myself to Christ as an adult. And I said, I'm having a hard time saying I love God. I don't know Him. Yeah. I love Jesus. I'm not Matthew. I, I, I was having, and I thought something, I said, what's wrong with me? I don't, I don't understand. He said, it's not an emotion. God doesn't say love me because you feel it. It really changed my whole concept. Yeah, and that's true. I mean, the, 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 our culture, our Western culture, we perceive love as being an emotion. That's not the biblical concept of love. The, the Bob Goff's uh, book that we've you know, read and used here in our church and that is a, a bestseller, Love Does. The title, Love Does, Goff's message there is love is an active verb. It's not an emotion. When Jesus talks about love your neighbor as yourself, he doesn't mean sit at all. And try to try to like this person first. No, it means act in a way that reflects a loving attitude. Love is a verb. It's an active thing. When we talk about loving God. That's a decision, not an emotion. Okay, and that's something that is is a is an act of our will rather than our emotion. That does not mean that it's wrong for us to feel emotion for God. All right, that's not wrong. But when that's the whole. You know, McGillicuddy, if that, when that's the whole focus, and if I'm not feeling that, I'm going to find another church. Because the worship there is just not satisfying for me anymore. That needs to be taught. They hear that. Yes. For me, I, you know, I was brought to Christianity by, in the Pentecostal movement. And, I, you know, I was, I've come to view worship as much as anything as prayer. I, and, and, and music is prayer. And I'm offered a prayer. And, uh, being uh, the ancestry of being Scots Irish and being Stoic, New Englander, <laughs> Scots Irish Pentecostal. Oh my God! Wow! <laughs> it was a way of getting out of myself and out of the stoicism that yeah. I've, been, I've been raised with, and breaking out of that mold, if you will. Right. And I like the contemporary services, and I, I despise the ancient language of these and thous and, and nines and so on. And, and, and I just think it's an ancient language that doesn't relate to me. And so for me, it's just, uh, it's lifting. But on the other hand, I don't think it's a necessarily high, I don't think. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like, and like again, there, there are differences, and I'm not saying one's right and one's wrong. I'm just saying, whichever it is, where, what's our motivation? Where are we coming from? And how are we going to react to that? If someone says, I don't, I'm not going to go to that church anymore because I don't find their worship satisfying, or I don't go to that church because their music is boring, what does that say? And, and how do we need to deal with that? Carol? Well, you had that one saying before, that Latin one, that had something about emotions lead to your beliefs, lead to your... Right. Worship leads to beliefs, which leads yeah. to how you okay. live your life. I, I changed worship to emotion in my head, because um, emotion is what motivates, yeah. right? It's what makes you change. It's what make, it, Emotion is what makes you do stuff. Not the you, only thing that makes you do not stuff. Not the only thing, no. Yeah. But, but it can be a cognitive <laughs> determination of will. 
But wow, is that hard if it you is. don't have any It is hugely <laughs> motivating. And that's why I'm saying I'm not, I'm not discounting that. I'm just yeah. saying we think, need to recognize if we have sort of a monolithic <coughs> motivation, whether it's emotion or you know, cognitive, I don't like that preacher because I don't think he, he is intellectual enough. Well, hmm. right? Is that, is that not an extreme in, the, in a different direction and perhaps yes. just as problematic? Mm -hmm. Where is the balance? Well, let's start yeah, with this. Just one quick yeah. observation. Um, everything we're talking about is more to do with worship as defined between 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock. But worship is the whole shebang. It's the church, the people, the fellowship. And the seven and twenty-four or three sixty-five. Yeah. So that's where we're going. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> later. Um, what is worship? It brings us to that point. Okay. We looked at history. Looked at some of the you know, very very quickly some evaluations. Defining worship is very hard. Okay. For that reason, is it the thing you do when you gather at a certain time? Is it the way you live your life? What is it? Now, sociologically speaking, and I'm not saying that that's necessary, but we start there. We start with kind of the, the background knowledge. Christian worship is a form of ritual. Now, ritual has become a bad word. It really should not be a bad word. Early Christian worship was all about ritual, the drama of the ritual. Ritual is defined as a human behavior that is purposeful, it is repetitive, it's social and interpersonal, and it serves a communion function, a communal function. Um, it is something that, we, that is meaningful that we gather together and do as part of what it means to be a community together. Now, that's any kind of ritual. Monday night football is a ritual for a lot of people, okay? Um, so ritual is not limited just to worshiping God. But let's start out by understanding that there's some, because of the, you know, sociologically, there's some pieces that need to be part of it. You know, people who say, um, oh yeah, I don't, I, I never go to church. I don't need to be with those people. I go out in my uh, yard and look up at the clouds and I worship God there. Well, I think you can do that. But scripture says, there's a reason why scripture says, forsake not the gathering of yourselves together. The Bible says, if you are going to worship me, so you need to do it on your own, too. But part of what it means to be a Christian is to worship in community. Again, a thousand years ago, if you suggested that a person could be a worshiping Christian and live enti in entirely on their own, unless they were in prison or, you know, stranded on desert island someplace, if they chose to do that, they go, not possible. You cannot truly be a Christian and voluntarily isolate yourselves from others. Because worship... By nature is a ritual and by definition that involves community and there's and scripture tells us that okay this isn't just sociology speaking so let's talk a little bit about worship what worship means too so, in uh, so what happens now with all these people that they do home church well home church is just uh, you know you're still yeah, gathering right. in community home church you don't do by yourself you bring other people in um, and there are some places where that's necessary. You know, in China, there are some churches which are in China which are recognized by the government. You know, technically, officially, the government of China is atheistic. They do allow certain registered churches to meet, but it's believed that because of the number of Christians who don't meet in registered churches in China, but rather meet in home churches, there may be more Chinese Christians than all the rest of the Christians in the whole rest of the world. And they all meet home churches. But what happened with when there are churches around? And they rather, I don't know, is it just... I, I, don't, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, that's no different. We're, we're no longer in a situation where the parish church is the expectation. I mean, the difference there is I'm, I'm meeting in a home church rather than the Presbyterian church or the Baptist church or the Assemblies of God church. That's just a matter of choosing a church. But if you're still meeting in community and you're still participating, you know, in, in, as long as you're not sacrificing babies or, you know, eating raw chicken or something like that, then you're okay. Um, but no, I think that's just a different style of church. It's not a different theological difference. Okay, so. Was that not the original church? Well, the original churches the were home churches. Homes yeah. home churches. Different places, not a exactly. structure designed specifically. Right, and we started as a home church. 
I mean, this church started meeting in the Courtney's house and then moved over to the rental place on the Carretera, and now we're here. So, yeah, home church, in fact, many, many churches begin as home churches. Um, in 1544, interestingly, and the, at this point in the conversation, at the dedication of the first church that was built specifically for Protestant worship, Torgau, Martin Luther said of Christian worship, because he did the dedication of this place that was built for Protestant worship, he said that nothing else be done in worship than that our dear Lord himself talk to us through his holy word, and that we in turn talk with him in prayer and songs of praise. Luther was a musician. He wrote songs which we still have in our songbook. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. That's Luther. And I've heard people who don't like traditional music say, what the heck's a bulwark? Okay. Well, expand your vocabulary, because that's a real word. Um, so, you know, Luther was very much into music, and so we hear him. He, sort of, in Protestantism, he sort of introduced that focus. Calvin was much less musically oriented, by the way, um, and le much less of an emphasis. Then, again, Luther. Luther, who was the first Protestant. In his larger catechism, as part of the Heidelberg Confession, Luther emphasizes the duality of revelation and response. You see that in the first part of that. We do nothing more than that our dear Lord himself talk to us, revelation, through his holy word, and then we, in return, talk to him in prayer, response. Revelation, response. So, revelation and response in the larger catechism, Luther says that in worship, the people assemble to hear and discuss God's word, revelation, and then praise God with song and prayer, response. It starts with God, not with me and whether I find this emotionally satisfying. No matter what it is, whether it's traditional hymns, contemporary music, whatever else it is, it starts with the presence of God. And in many cases, I think that's something that we've, begun, we've lost or begun to lose. Thomas Cranmer, also somebody who knew something about worship, said that worship is directed to God's glory and to right human conduct. Revelation, response. Cranmer said, setting forth of God's honor and glory and the reducing of the people to the most perfect and godly living. In other words, we acknowledge God's presence, His glory and honor, and we are changed by it. Revelation, response. That, I think, is, an, is a critical part of it. Now, when you get into, and later on we're going to talk about particulars of what's involved in communal worship in a church or in a home church or in wherever it is, because we're going to work our way to more specifics. Um, it has been generally recognized that there's two aspects to most church services or most, most worship events. <coughs> Um, within a church, there's a focus on structure and there's a focus on services. Structure would be how we're organized. We use the lectionary. We recognize the, you know, the, the holy days, you know, the church calendar. I don't know if you all who attend our church know this, but we will always acknowledge the fact that it is the 18th Sunday after Pentecost, or if it is Trinity Sunday or whatever. We don't emphasize that a lot, but it's always in the bulletin. So we do acknowledge the church calendar as well, and obviously the major holidays that come along, Lent, Advent, Christmas, Easter, Ash Wednesday, all of those are acknowledgments. So one of the structures is the structure of time, of the calendar. And then of services. Services would include communion, you know, the offering of the sacraments. Those are the services. Uh, depending on what kind of church you go to, your, your sacraments may include more than just baptism and, and the Lord's Supper, which is in most Protestant churches. Uh, Anglican churches include more as well. I actually had an Anglican priest on a trip we took recently argue with me that they were Protestants. I went, well, that's interesting. <laughs> Anglicans aren't Protestants. Okay. Um, it's interesting that you were formed as a Calvinist organization, you know, uh, when Elizabeth I, you know, Queen of England, when she was trying to figure out how to keep the Catholics and the Protestants from killing each other, she created the Church of England as a church that had Protestant Calvinist theology, but had all the appearance of Catholicism. That's why Anglicans look a lot like Catholics, but aren't. She stopped wars that way. Okay. So, what is worship? A simple definition uh, sometimes used is that it is reverent honor and homage paid to God. I think it's a little more complicated than that, but that's a good basis. 
Another definition, Christian worship is response to the divine call, to the mighty deeds of God culminating in the redemptive act of Christ. Here again you hear revelation, the divine call, response. That's a good way to understand what worship is. Christian worship is primarily and essentially an act of praise and adoration. Oops, sorry. <laughs> praise and adoration, which also implies a thankful acknowledgement of God's embracing love and redemptive loving kindness. Martin Luther, by the way, also said, to have a God is to worship Him. Don't worship Him, you don't really have a God. Actually, a television show Carolyn and I watched once. There was this, and it hadn't to do anything with Christianity. It was like this primitive um, kind of alien culture thing. And this guy says, you know, well, we have worshipped this goddess since long before you have. And the guy said, what do you mean by worship? And he said, we mean the same thing worship has always meant, sacrifice. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it's true. It's true. Present yourselves a living sacrifice. Does the scripture tell us that? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not going to do that because your music is boring. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not giving you, this is true, this is false. I'm saying, do we not need to struggle with this? Or at least deal with it. Um, worship is for the glory of God and the sanctification and edification of the faithful. This is Pope Pius IX, or X. And this definition has subsequently been used over and over again in the Catholic Church. Worship is glorifying God and sanctifying and educating the faithful. I think that's a pretty good definition. Mm -hmm. If it's all about God, we walk out confused. If it's all about us, wouldn't it have been nice if we'd invited God to be there? <laughs> In fact, I think next week my lecture is going to be entitled Inviting God to Church. Um, this is Franklin Segler, who is one of, the, one of the authors of one of the books you've got. Worship is not a human invention. Rather, it is a divine offering. God offers himself in a personal relationship, and we respond. Revelation? Response. God's love, offer of love, elicits our response in worship. So that idea of revelation and response is one we'll keep coming back to. Giving, you know, the glory of God is present. We are edified and sanctified. Worship is the offering of our total selves. This again is secular. Of our total selves to God, our intellects, our feelings, our attitudes, and our possessions. What a difference that would make. If we really, all of us, understood that our responsibility to worship God was to give Him our intellects, our feelings, our attitudes, and our possessions, what a difference would that make? Okay, we're going to take a break. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about what constitutes worship. I almost feel as though this week, another way to describe it, I didn't realize this until a few minutes ago, is this week I'm sort of pulling it all apart, and then I'll spend seven more weeks putting it all back together, okay? We're looking at the components of worship in areas that in modern times there may legitimately be concerns in various directions, but um, worship, that is corporate worship, I'm talking about individual worship now, which we're also called to do, especially for the in fact. Corporate worship, uh, both biblically and through church history, is about remembrance and about anticipation. This is one of the most important things I think I figured out in my study for this. Remembrance means that when we worship, we should remember what God has done, especially in the act of Christ for us. But it is a matter of remembering what God has done for us, what Jesus did for us. And then it is anticipation in that we are then anticipating what God will do. You'll notice in both cases it's a focus on God. What God has done, remembrance. What God will do, what He has promised He will do, anticipation. The consummation, the fulfillment of God's promises to us. That's what real worship down through the history of the church and what worship biblically <coughs> is. It is an act of remembrance and of anticipation. 
of looking to the past and remembering what God has done and looking to the future and anticipating what He will do. And yet many of us are just stuck right here. There are three aspects or components of worship. There's a um, Robert Weber is was a professor of theology at Wheaton College. He really specialized. His, his focus was in worship, and he wrote a wonderful book called uh, "Our Ancient Future Worship." And he really developed this theme. Our ancient future worship is that worship is an act of remembrance, the ancient part, and it is anticipation, future. And his sense was that proper worship for us today, in terms of corporate worship, is a, a matter of capturing that remembrance and anticipation by both recognizing all the, the, the things God has done in, in leading his people in, in their worship styles and content in the past, while also looking to how God would desire us to recognize and worship him now and in the future. We don't have to be stuck in the past. But that's not usually our problem. Our problem is usually we won't even look at the past. I'll mention that in a minute. But Robert Weber identifies three primary components or aspects of worship. The first is content. What is actually uh, the meaning behind what we're doing? You know, what is, what is the, the quality of content behind it? And Weber says that we really do suffer more than anything else a crisis of content in our modern worship. He describes modern worship's lack of content as, as causing it to be disembodied, dehistoricized, and individualized. Now, what's he mean by that? Disembodied, he talks about the fact that our worship services tend to be disconnected from anything else. They're sort of free-floating. You know, people wander in, at, you know, for a 10 o'clock service, and they spend an hour in there, and they wander out, and there's no connection between any of the rest of their lives. It's a, like a one-hour time warp for a lot of people. Um, and it doesn't flow out of our spirituality that we experience the rest of our lives. Secondly, he says that it is dehistoricized, uh, which means it's not connected to, and in many cases, it's not even aware of all that God has done in the history, there's a great German theological world, the word Heilsgeschichte, which means salvation history. Which means God's salvation for us, he has enacted through history. There is a history of salvation, and therefore of worship, that God has, uh, has manifested through his people down through history. And yet we don't even know that. Um, human beings today suffer greatly from, from um, chronocentrism. Get into that again. Chronocentrism means uh, it's it's like ethnocentrism. Ethnocentrism is you think your ethnic group is the only one. Chronocentrism is we believe our time period is the only one. Anything before or anything after doesn't really matter. It's just here and now. Okay. So we are de we have, we are dehistoricized. We don't have a sense of the richness of Christian history, and what has come before, with regard to the content of our worship. The idea that th there's a history of the church emphasizing that worship was about the liturgy of word and table. That would be completely foreign language to anybody who's not a high Anglican. The high Anglicans still, still talk about the liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the table. That has been so much the structure that churches that worship has been built on, and yet we've completely lost that history. And then thirdly, individualized. It is not about the body of Christ. It's not even about Christ. It's about me. And me being in a place that I find satisfying. My worship, my experience, my presence. Now God cares about me. He cares about you. And he wants us to come to him and worship. But it's become entirely about me. Entirely individualized. And therefore, we've lost all the content of what it means to be the body of Christ and to come together in an act of worship for Fortunately, we're addressing those crises here. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. You mean here at this church or uh, in this class? Here. Okay. In this church. In this church. Good. <laughs> <laughs> we still have a long way to go. Um, and then the second aspect or component of worship after content is structure. This is where we get into the, the fact that the story of God is communicated through, the, and I'm quoting Robert Weber here, through the narrative of word and table. The structure means how do we put together these worship services. Uh, that's been God's narrative to us, is, 
the narrative of word and table. The word read and preached, which remember God's story through the Christ event, and the Eucharist prayers and songs and symbols that usher us into the future kingdom. See, the Eucharist is not, is not so much a celebration, it's, it's a recognition of what God, Christ has done for us, but more than that, it's a celebration of what is to come. It's a looking forward. So again, you're looking at the Word remembers what God has done, a remembrance. The Eucharistic prayers, I'm talking historically now, in, in terms of the structure that church was built around, looks forward to the future, the anticipation. Um, we don't just, we don't, you know, in the, the words of institution, when I do the words of institution, I'll say, you know, um, we remember Christ, what, do you remember the rest of it? Until he comes again. That's the future part, the anticipation. So that this body and blood is for us, the very body and blood, uh, this uh, bread and cup is for us, the very, very body and blood of Christ, by which we remember him until he comes again. And then the third, which is the one that has really kind of got, gotten us in recent difficulty, I think, in some ways, is style. Um, Weber agrees that music is where corporate walter, uh, worship is contextualized, and it may be viewed as a cultural package. And it is legitimate to an extent that congregational worship translates our beliefs into a language that people can understand. But if in the process of doing so, we are doing it along guidelines or with, um, you know, with directives that are not Christ-centered, but are culture-centered, are entertainment-centered, mm -hmm. are celebrity-centered, then we have gotten off track. Again, when Paul said, I become all things to all men, that by all means I might save some, he was saying, he was talking about contextualizing. And I think we can do that with music, with language, with ritual, with all sorts of things. But when we, when our motivation for that is not to reflect Christ better, but rather to simply be more attractive, then maybe we're on the, you know, we've taken the wrong path. Now Weber's definition of worship, he says, the common tradition of the church's worship in word, table, and song, practiced faithfully and communicated clearly in every context, is worship. So again, worship is the common tradition of the church in table, in word, and song, practiced faithfully and communica communicated clearly. Um, another author that I, I work from, based on Robert Weber's ancient future kind of model, he says ancient future worship is worship that remembers and anticipates, remember, remembrance, anticipation, mm -hmm. that remembers and anticipates God's creating and saving work in his world through embodied practices, remember this is ritual, it's practices, through embodied practices that reflect the story of God's people as we gather around the scripture and the sacrament with songs that are in the stylistic language of our cultural context. It's right? a long definition. But it basically, the key there is remembrance and anticipation. So three challenges that I think face modern worship that we see reflected. The first one is limited supernaturalism. What does that mean? <laughs> Most of us today, um, we are only really comfortable with what philosophers would call a God of the gaps. In other words, we expect that God appears at certain times when we have problems or when we gather for meetings. But the rest of the time, he doesn't need to be there. You know, we don't really involve him in the rest of our lives. So limited supernaturalism, as opposed to complete supernaturalism, in which we recognize and live out the fact that God is always there. He is always present everywhere in his creation. If we really had that kind of concept, do you not think that would change our understanding of worship and how we practice it, both individually and corporately? We, we have God, you know, we've got a little God bell, and whenever we decide we're going to get together for worship, ding, 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 okay, God, you can come now. God is everywhere, at all times, in all places, in all aspects of our lives, we just don't recognize that, and that's one of the dangers that we run into in all of our Christian life, but also especially we're talking about in our worship. Secondly, and I've already talked about this briefly, the anti-historical bias, the chronocentrism, this idea that today, in our time, here in the early 21st century, 
we are smarter, we are better, we're more advanced, we have more understanding and more experience, our music is better, you know, we, everything about us is better than anything in the past. So what possibly could we learn from the past? I actually had a long conversation with a couple several years ago telling me that human beings were inherently better now than they used to be. <laughs> really? Well, yes, you know, we're more moral, we have, we have better societies and everything else. I said, really? Do you watch the news? There was a, uh, the movie Time After Time. Is Time After Time or Somewhere in Time? Time After Time. I'm always forgetting of using those two titles. It was, uh, Malcolm McDowell uh, was in it, and he played H.G. Wells. And he was inventing a time machine. Well, a good friend of his, he would have a group of men who would get together in England, and this is during the time period of Jack the Ripper. It turns out that the police show up, and one of his friends at this dinner party they have every week is Jack the Ripper. <laughs> and he slipped out, and they can't find him. And she else goes downstairs and finds out that his time machine is gone from his basement, and that the guy has come back to, he's gone forward, excuse me, to the 20th century. And so the machine is, is you know, set up so that it will always go back to where it started from after a period of time. So it shows up again. And so H.G. Wells gets in and sees where it, what time he went to, and he goes forward. Long, long after. <laughs> well, he gets there, and the guy who was Jack the Ripper, he said, this time is perfect for me. And he turns on the TV, and there's war, and there's murder, and there's people shooting each other in the streets, and there's flamethrowers, and there's, you know, tanks, and there's planes bombing, and napalm, and all. He goes, I was made for this time! <laughs> okay? And we think people are better? I finally got this, this couple to agree that the way and only way in which we can see people are better is we've gotten a little bit better at policing as a society. You know, we have better police forces and more control. Well, the reason we have to have more control is because we've got more trying to break out, right? So, but this idea that here in the Western world we have an obsession with progress. Mm -hmm. We have an obsession with us getting better and better. Every day in every way we're getting better and better. <laughs> it's basically a belief that we have whether we're conscious of it or not. And so because of that we have a tendency to have very little use for the past. And that means we have excluded what God has done in the past. What the church has discovered in the past. What the church has experienced in the past. Surely what God did in the past and what the people of the church did in the past can't be nearly as important or valuable as what we do now. And so we reinvent the week. And we do that in more ways than just worship service or worship style or anything like that. Um, I'll, I'll be very direct. Church here, and here locally um, asked me to come minister and left there. They asked me to come and talk with them and help them. And, and I realized that one of the fundamental problems is they had made up their own sort of book of order. And they had their own policies for how church was going to be structured and who was going to be in authority and what they had to do. And it included things like, if you want to be a member, just fill out a card and drop it in the offering plate. You're a member! Wow. Doesn't matter what you believe. Mm -hmm. If you want to be an elder, then just have one of the other elders put your name in a card and drop it in the plate. You're an elder! Mm -hmm. Well, there are reasons why there have been processes that the church has developed over time to make it a little bit more complicated than that. And you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I mean, our church, we are, we are in effect, a non-denominational church. We don't belong to any other denomination. We don't belong to the Presbyterian church of any kind, any flavor in the U.S. And there's reasons for that. It's not because of insisting on our own independence. We couldn't, quite literally, legally. And yet, we volunteer to use the book of order of the Presbyterian Church USA Older versions, they've added some things recently we don't agree with. But older versions of that is our Constitution. And we choose that because they've been working on that for 400 years. We don't need to reinvent all that stuff. And yet so many churches today, they think, we're going to start from scratch. We're going to do it right. That's because they assume that they haven't done it right before. That there is no validity in that history. I was consulting with a church down in California. And it was a church started by a pastor and his wife and another couple, and they'd grown up. They had no historical foundations. They had no denominational connections. They had four elders, and one of the elders, I was interviewing him for this, this process I was going through for them. And he said, yeah, my wife came to me and said, um, well, I'm part of a women's group, and we want to baptize each other, but 
we don't really want to tell anybody about it, so we'd like to just do it ourselves, not have anybody else there, and do it in, a low, in one of our swimming pools. Is that okay? And the other one, sure, that's fine. He's telling me this, and I'm thinking, <laughs> baptism is supposed to be a public declaration of your faith in Christ, and it should be preceded by some kind of instruction. They may be dipping each other in the swimming pool saying, we recognize you, O oh God, and Mother Earth, and the Gaia who has given us birth. We don't know what they were believing or what they were saying. There's a reason why there has been a tradition about that. But this church, no connection to any history. They thought they had a better way to do it. Um, we have an anti-historical bias, and it affects our worship as well as our theology. And lastly, particularly modern, is um, the sacramentalization of singing. That singing and the, the emotional uh, effect that that has on us is in some way a sacrament. As I say, worship has become synonymous with the singing time. Well, isn't it all supposed to be worship? You know, um, I think it is. Everything that we do is supposed to be part of worship, and yet we have this idea that somehow the process of singing is sacramental. It is somehow of a higher level of importance than any of the other things that we do. Okay? So what should proper worship be? First, it should, it must be Christ-centered. In contrast to being audience-driven or personal, you know, an issue driven by personal fulfillment, Worship, and that includes the congregational music, must not be shaped around the congregation. It must be shaped around Jesus, around the Christ. That's the focus. This means that the content of the song should point to Christ. It means the sermon ends not with a call to try harder or be better, but rather to behold Christ the Redeemer. It should all point to Jesus, not to us. And it shouldn't be what so many, and I'm sounding critical, but it's because this is an issue we need to deal with. I, I, I'm critical about extremes in all directions. But in a lot of contemporary Christian music, they're basically, and, and Carol will recognize this, that Jesus is my boyfriend is the theme of the music. Okay? That, that you know, oh Jesus, I just love him so much. What about the Christ who is the Lord of the universe? who shed his blood for me. The sacrifice of Christ on the cross that we acknowledge on the altar table. We've left all that part off. It's, it's like a, a really, so much of what we do is like a really cheesy, Jesus is my boyfriend kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. It's like um, uh, Crocodile Dundee, me and God, we're mates. No, you're not! God is not your mate. The God of the universe is not your mate. And Jesus is not your boyfriend. He is the Christ. There's a reason why here it doesn't say around Jesus, but rather around Jesus who is the Christ, the anointed one of God. Now, he loves us. You know, he is our friend, too. He allows that. But he is our Redeemer, our Christ. And we have to make sure that's the focal point. Secondly, it has to be gospel-shaped. Worship must orient people to scripture and the sacraments, word and table again. Remembrance and anticipation. That really is what gospel shape means. But too many times now church services are structured like a variety show. And now coming on our stage for your enjoyment, we've got whatever it is. Is that not true sometimes? Uh, that doesn't mean we should not enjoy our worship. We should. I love nothing better, for instance, than when we get kids involved. Mm -hmm. And I love it not only because people enjoy it and are inspired by it, but also what better way to make the children believe that this Christian thing is a great idea and I'm going to stick with this. Right? That's why while I'm not a big clapper in church, the one thing I will always applaud grandly for is anything the kids are doing. Because I want them to get that sense of yeah. approval, this is something I want to be part of. And third, worship must be spirit-filled. I don't mean that in the Pentecostal sense of spirit-filled, but rather in the sense of Pentecost. What happened at Pentecost was in order to communicate with the people, God gave many different languages to 
the apostles and disciples who were present so that a lot of different people could understand it and be convicted by it. What I mean by that is it doesn't, doesn't mean we have to do everything to try to make them feel happy and comfortable. Sometimes the best thing we can do is make people feel a little uncomfortable. Okay? The most Christian thing we could do. But we shouldn't use language that nobody can understand. If I get up there and I start talking about, well, God has given me a vision of the hermeneutical horizon that he desires for us. Do you even get that? If we start using either Christianese that only the in-group understands or start using theological language or anything else that we're communicating in a way that ordinary people can't understand it, then we're going against the idea of the Holy Spirit giving us the ability to communicate with a wide range of people. That, that God's for everybody. And we have a responsibility not to do something that's going to intentionally exclude them. That doesn't mean our job is to try to keep them entertained. I was, I was struck the last, see, many years ago, um, some friends of mine, of mine and I in Seattle went to a Seattle Sonics game, basketball game. They're not even there anymore. And when we went there, the thing that shocked me is this basketball game. They would play basketball and then, you know, there'd be a timeout. The instant that they weren't actually dribbling the ball up and down the court, they had something else going on. There were people out dancing on the court. There were drones flying over, dropping, you know, presents on people. There were people tossing uh, t-shirts into the air. It's like, I'm looking at this and thinking, people cannot sit for three minutes without being entertained. I don't know what they would have done, get up and leave. Well, is that not true for us today? Whatever happened to be still and know that I am God? You know, we have moments of silence in our worship service. And I think, I'm pretty sure some people get uncomfortable with that. You know, we have a time of confession of sin. And I've had some people tell me they really like it. I think some people are uncomfortable with that. Why are you focusing on this negative stuff? When I was in seminary, I mentioned the fact that we were talking about the Korean girl who came to, our Korean young woman who came to our, one of our meetings and after we went an hour and a half or something and afterwards she said, what, you know, is that it? Is that all? We're used to going all night. Well, that same group, that same fellowship we had on campus, um, there were three of us leaders, myself, a woman who was from the Christian Reformed Church and a, a fellow who was from a non-denominational sort of contemporary worship church. We started planning some, some times for Lent and Easter. And Sue, who was from the Christian Reform tradition, and myself, Reform, we started talking about maybe doing a tenebrae service, which we have here every Good Friday. Tenebrae <coughs> means the service of darkness, because it is the day in which we recognize the sacrifice Jesus made for us. And it is a very somber event. We ask people not to talk. We ask them to leave in silence. There's a point in the service where we extinguish the candles one at a time until there is no candle left. And then we bring back the Christ candle, to the symbol of his resurrection. When we were talking about doing that, uh, Tom, who was the guy from the non-denominational contemporary worship group, he said, why in the world would you do that? That sounds like such a bummer. He said, I've got music we can sing that's really up, you know, and it's really, and I, and Sue and I looked at him, oh, holy moly. And I said, that's Easter morning. But before you get to Easter morning, you have to go through Good Friday, the darkness and the grief and the sacrifice. And when we stop understanding and, and participating in the grief of Good Friday, then we don't have any right to celebrate the glory of Easter morning. Mm -hmm. we, haven't, we haven't, in effect, earned it. I don't mean that we earn our own salvation, but we have to acknowledge what Jesus did for us in his sacrifice before we can celebrate the resurrection. Tom didn't get that. He came from a tradition where they would never do a downer like that. I'm sure he, if he were to do that, he'd have a problem. Why are you confessing your sins? People can do that at home. <laughs> if they really need to. Okay, you can see what I mean, that we, we, we really need to focus. Now, I mentioned that I've got some articles. One of the articles, this is from it. This is a young man who is himself a millennial. He describes himself. He's been a worship leader. And he, he, this article is all the reasons why he believes that modern contemporary worship focus is not only not historical in the faith, it's not theologically accurate, and it's not biblical. This is, and he said, and I are one. Kind of thing. <laughs> this is my tradition. And he talks about the issue of modern worship. He said the real discussion about this, and he, he says, others say, the worship wars are mostly over. People have either gone one way or the other, or they figured out how, some way to coexist. 
either by having multiple services that are different or whatever. In our case, we try to do a blended service. But he talks about the modern perception of worship, especially this traditional versus contemporary, as having been, we, we set it up all wrong, we framed it poorly. And he has this following list of what he thinks are truths. It's not about old or new. It's not about old versus young, and he says especially these days, because he says, I'm getting older. And he, he mentions the fact that one person in his church who's grown up as a millennial, but as a child had gone to church where they had all the traditional hymns, and, and learned the old rugged cross, and all of the, all the uh, great traditional hymns that were so meaningful. But then, as he got older, he started going to a contemporary worship service, and, and the guy came to this worship leader and pastor and said, I realize that my daughter now, who has never been anywhere except a contemporary worship service, that she's never going to know those old hymns. And he said, and it makes me mad <laughs> that we have lost all of that. There's another article that I read that said um, that the majority of modern contemporary Christian music is really bad. And it has to be. Statistically, it's not possible. We've had just the Protestant side of the Christian faith, we've had 500 years of writing music to help us in our worship. Contemporary Christian music has only been around for about 40, 40 or 50. And he said, from a pure statistical point of view, the likelihood that they could have produced a body of work that could compete with 500 years. And, and he points out that, you know, John Wesley, who was another great hymn writer and leader of the church, Less than 1% of all of the hymns that he wrote, he wrote 6,500, and typically less than 1% of those get published today. Well, if John Wesley got less than 1%, then how can we think that the majority of contemporary Christian music written today is really of quality? He says, statistically, that's not viable. And so, and again, these are people coming out of that. So it's not about old or young, and, and this writer says, particularly when I realize I'm not on the young side of this, even though he's grown up as a millennial. And doesn't he also say that baby boomers are the ones who mostly want the contemporary? Exactly. Music? In fact, he says that. He said, yeah. today it is the younger people are moving back to tradition. He and a couple of other authors that I've been reading are saying that contemporary Christian music, while it is not dying, it's not going to die. It is receding. There is less and less and less emphasis on contemporary Christian worship and more of a return to the traditional. And one of the things he says in this article is the people who are really still pushing for contemporary Christian worship are are the older ones, the baby boomers and the older millennials. Their kids, so it's the parents that are pushing for that, their kids want to go back to either more blended or more traditional, in his experience, which is very interesting. Um, it's not about taste. It's not what I like or don't like. It's not about what kind of music God likes more. <laughs> Which some people would say that. I mean, again, I've heard people make jokes about traditional music as though it were stupid. And I've heard people say, you know, that they thought contemporary music was just shallow and wasteful. I don't think either one of those things is true. It's not really about music at all. It's about where our hearts are and what we understand worship to be, which is why we're doing this class. It's about the very purpose of gathering worship. It's about unity, not choice. I think there really was something to it in the old days when you were expected to go to the parish church. Every, every village, every town, within a certain geographical area, there was one church. That was the parish church. And you went to your parish church. That was your community. Now the fact that we can go to whatever church tickles our fancy, it both makes us more shallow. We have bad theology, and it has broken down a lot of community. I'm not saying that I wish it were back the old way, but there were some real advantages to that. It's about Holy Scripture, not self-help. From the way of saying it's not about me, it's about God. It's about theology, not experience. What is right, not what feels good. It's about participation, not consumption. This is not a football game where you get to go and root for your favorite team. It's not an entertainment. It's not consumption. You are there to participate in the worship of God with others. It's about liturgy, not Jesus-y entertainment. Liturgy is the structure of the words and the sacrament, the way we communicate our act of worship. We'll talk about liturgy later. It's about being a church for the world, not getting butts in the seats. <laughs> 
It's not about how big can we get. <coughs> Carolyn and I, who are we talking to about the giving units thing? On, oh, uh, on, the, on the cruise, giving units. Oh. We yes. were talking to a couple who had been attending a church, and they were a, a church plant from another larger church, and that church finally decided they were going to withdraw their support of them because they, were, they had not grown to the point that they could justify themselves by giving units. Meaning, not enough, you don't have enough people and those people aren't giving enough money, so we're shutting you down. Oh. You'd be surprised how often that's actually the mindset. You know, and, and when he was telling, you know, well, they told us we didn't have enough giving units, and he kept going on, and, and after a few minutes, Carolyn went, wait. I stopped at giving units. <laughs> it's about the ancient and the future, not now. Remembrance, anticipation. It's not about just now. Being chronocentric, focused entirely on our own time, is not biblical. It's theologically immature. Now this is Jonathan uh, Anye, I, I don't know if you pronounce it Anye, Agner, or whatever. I grew up, my, my mother uh, and sister also always used to talk about how nice it would be to get Agner purse. I, I had no idea. They, they had no idea. I had no idea for a long time. This is a French name. It's Anye. It's not Agner. But, um, so the question, what constitutes good worship and why? That's what we're investigating. Here's another T. David Gordon. This, um, Jonathan Anye quotes T. David Gordon, and I've got an article by him too. He says, and this is a contemporary Christian worship guy. He says, contemporary worship to me is an oxymoron. Biblically, worship is what angels and morning stars did before creation. The morning stars were the angels who sang praise to God at creation. What Abraham, Moses, and the Levites, and the many-tongued Jewish diaspora at Pentecost did. The diaspora was the spreading out, so many-tongued means all the Jews who lived in all those different places and then came back for Pentecost, Pentecost and experienced the Holy Spirit, uh, hearing all those different languages. It's what the martyrs now ascended do, and what all believers since the apostles have done. More importantly, it is what we will do eternally. Worship is essentially, not accidentally, eschatological, meaning it is end times, it is future, the anticipation. And nothing could celebrate the eschatological forever less than something that celebrates the contemporary now. How can we be talking about anticipation of the future when our whole focus is now? So ultimately, I think the Apostles' Creed will stick its camel's nose into the liturgical tent and assert against our celebration of the, quote, Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the sooner the better. There's a reason why in our church we use the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, one each week. Those are the most ancient universal statements of faith in the church. Um, I once had a guy, a young man, challenge me, said, why in the world would you use a creed? The creed is a human invention. Why don't you just use the New Testament? And my response was, try standing up on Sunday morning and reciting the New Testament <laughs> as a statement of what you believe. The creed we accept as being an accurate and appropriate and divinely inspired summary that we can work with in worship of what it is we believe. And yet, most modern contemporary churches are not using it. They don't use the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed or any of the other books, the, the creeds that are in the book, of, uh, the book of Creeds. I think there are 13 of them, if I remember right. And which includes uh, the Mormon Confession that was written by the Confessing Church during the Nazi regime in Germany and a lot of other wonderful statements of the Christian faith. So what do you think about this? I don't want to overplay this, but this is the biggest question about worship. And like I said, I've been sort of taking things apart today, and then we'll rebuild them in the future. By the way, this is that article by T. David Gordon, and he calls it the imminent decline of contemporary worship music, eight reasons. Now, look at that young woman on the front. Yeah. Remember what I said about beautiful young yes. women who are praising yes. God? They're never fat, ugly girls. What does that tell us about what we're looking for? They should watch the Gator Gospel album. Yeah, well, the Gator Gospel. <laughs> That's true. Um, and I feel like I've, 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 I've made the appearance that I'm picking on contemporary music. I'm not. It's just that's the most obvious thing. That's the most obvious example, the one we would know best, where we need to look at it and go, what does this tell us about our right or wrong understanding of worship? There's some spectacular things about 
the great, the great worship awakening that's happened in the last 50 years. And there's some real problems. Our goal is to learn to worship rightly in the way that is most honoring to God. And so we need to question some of our assumptions in both directions. Yes? By having the singing before the actual sermon or the service coming out of the church you go to, doesn't that kind of prepare you to open your heart for God? To open His Word? Because when you're singing, you're worshiping. Some feel, some don't. But to them, it opens their heart and gets them ready and prepares them. But that's emotional. Are you, are you worshiping when you do the responsive reading? Are you worshiping when you listen to the reading of Scripture? Are you worshiping when you give during the tithes and offerings? Mm -hmm. See, my sense is all of it ought to be worshiped. So it all goes together. Yeah, and so in the, the order, um, the churches differ on that. I mean, in terms of liturgically, there are, I remember when Earl Palmer came to our church in Seattle. Um, he really questioned the location of the sermon because he felt like everything was building up to that and he wanted to do it earlier in the service. You know, not wait not at the you know, not start of the service, but somewhere, you know, two thirds of the way through, not at the very end. Where previous to that they'd done it's like everything built up to the sermon is the da 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 and then they have the sermon and then they close in prayer and everybody went. Okay? Um, they had other things that happened after that. You try to do the same thing. Yes. And that, it, that's interesting because that's how I felt when I started going to an Episcopal church is that everything seemed to build up to the Eucharist. And I right. liked that. Yeah. It, it just seemed more appropriate and worshipful and yeah. everything else um, because it wasn't all building up to the sermon. And it's really, I wasn't there when Earl first came, yeah. so I never heard that. Yeah. Well, it's also true. Um, I mean, there's a part of me that would like for us to offer communion every week. Mm -hmm. The Lord's Table every week. The idea of the Word and Sacrament. Mm -hmm. Well, we do the sacrament once a month. A lot of churches these days will do it, you know, once a quarter, a fifth Sunday of every of every month. Meaning that only comes around once every three months. Um, my preaching teacher, who was Presbyterian, he was came from the Church of Scotland. He had Watson, greatest preacher ever heard. Ian used to say, "No matter how well I preach, no matter how the Spirit gifts me on a given Sunday." I have to decide, am I preaching, am I going to preach the repentance that's called for on Good Friday, or am I going to preach the joy of Easter morning? I mean, every sermon I have to decide, where am I going to go with this? And he said, the reality is that if I preach uh, Good Friday and somebody is feeling the joy of Easter morning, I'm not talking about on those days, but just if I'm preaching the, the sadness you know, of, our, of our repentance, and somebody is feeling the joy of their salvation, I miss them. If somebody is feeling the grief, you know, the dark night of the soul that St. John of the Cross talks about, if they're feeling that grief and really need something in that, and I'm preaching the joy of the resurrection, I'm going to miss them. He said, but the Eucharist, the communion, will touch them no matter where they are, whether they're in the darkness of Good Friday or the joy of Easter morning, that will communicate to them where they are. And he said, no matter how hard I try or how, you know, what I try to do, I'm going to miss some people on a Sunday morning. But the communion table doesn't miss anybody ever. And I've wondered, do I need to do more to emphasize the meaning of that? Do I, and these are questions that I'm struggling with. If I were to announce that we were going to have communion every week, I'd have a major rebellion. Um, so maybe I'll edge up to it. Maybe I'll start doing it twice a month or something. Um, so what do you all think about this? The one thing that occurs to me is that we you know, it hasn't been mentioned by any of the authors, and I, it fits, fits into many places. And that's the element of prayer, individually and group, mm -hmm. and the Lord's Prayer, which is your uh, individual and your 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 uh, congregation's uh, verbalization of, of what Christ asked us to do. That's uh, the Lord's Prayer is like a great, but it's, it brings us to your talking now. It's from the past, but it's your words now. Um, and your requests, your your bold requests for healing, for these. Other. So, prayer. I don't know what, 
to me, prayer is a part of worship. And that's why I say it, worship is not only in, at church, uh, though this is all right. we talk in church, but to me, worship uh, is saying grace, it's a ritual, but you, you say it with meaning, yep. you try to. Um, so, so prayer, anyway, and even I, grace I is a form of prayer. I mean, we're talking, we're, we're giving sort of a, you know, I use the word, we talked about meta-ethics in the last class, the idea of a kind of a 30,000 foot level. Yeah, yeah. We've not gotten into other than talking about music, because that's a big factor, you know, that's one of the major differences, but we haven't gotten into other elements, you know, like, like prayer, like reading of the Word, like etc. You know, and, and we use the Lord's Prayer. To me, the Lord's Prayer is like a creed. And Jesus gave it to us. And I had, I had one of the other ministers in town say, we don't use the Lord's Prayer because I don't think that's, that's appropriate. And he said, Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. And I didn't say anything to him, because I didn't know him that long of time. Still don't know him that well, but actually Jesus gave the Lord's Prayer twice, in Matthew and in Luke. And once he says, when you pray, pray like this. And the other place he says, when you pray, say this. So there's they justification. Say it and think about it and mean it. Yeah, but he, but he meant that that's the reason that we use the Lord's Prayer as it, was, as it is given to us, actually with a little addition, because of tradition, which is still theologically very valid. But the idea is that, um, you know, he said, say this, or like this, or whatever. For us, the, the Lord's Prayer is, for me, I see it as another creed. It is our statement of what we believe about, you know, about God and His blessing for us, and you know, all of that. Any other questions or comments about this? Yes? Okay, a couple things. In our time of silence, I wish it would last a little bit longer. Thank you, too. It seems so short. But I, I barely, you know, have time to talk with the Lord and it's over. Um, now we do it twice, twice. do you mean uh, yeah, the both, opening? Both, both times. times. Confession and... Confession um, is where it takes me long. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm in there. Yeah, it takes a little while to settle on that. Well, there, one of the questions we've had, see, some people, people have differences on yes. that. When, we, when I did kind of training for people involved in worship, the question of how long do I wait? We've talked about maybe do a long 10 count. You know, and the way I said, instead of saying one Mississippi, two Mississippi, okay. I said, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Do that 10 times. Okay. And we had a long 10 seconds or so. But the tendency people have is to feel like, oh my gosh, it's been forever. I better start again. You know, I better come oh, back yeah. again. So um, it's, it's not easy. It was easy. Um, I, I have something. That I'm just sort of grappling with this. Sometimes, you know, it'll take me a while to really formulate my question. Maybe I can come back next week with it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But I find that a lot of times I have these things going through my mind, and then when it's the moment for me to try to express them to my husband, you know, it takes me a while to, to get it out there. But, you know, we focused a lot today on contemporary worship music. And I understand that we're going to expand that. And, and we're talking about, and from the quotes that we've, we've listed here, we've talked about them being, uh, it's sort of missing the mark, if you will. Um, but then, and, and then we're talking about historically that in previous centuries had it right. Okay, but let's go back to the first... Actually, I, I'll just say, that's not really what I meant. All I was trying to say is that different centuries had a very different idea. Oh, that, okay, because, you know, I'm looking at the fourth century, if you will, and I'm, I'm thinking, okay, they adapted to Roman ceremonies uh, and brought that in. Right. I don't think that that's what... Jesus had in mind yeah. in the first, second, and third centuries, um, you know, because that was, uh, well, it, what, what's the word that I'm looking for here? Sorry, it escapes me. Syncretism. Um, you know, that was pagan worship, and then we have brought that into, and I, I say we because we still adapt right. drama and uh, and ritual, you right. know, in part of what we do. And so, you know, I think I'm grappling a little bit with, and, and maybe you answered the question, you're not saying one is, is right or wrong, you're just saying these are... Right. Exactly. I'm not saying that they always did it better before. In fact, the, the change that occurred in the fourth century, and, and a different kinds of changes, but part of it was their sort of adaptation of, of pagan ritual, 
is one of the reasons why the monastic movement exploded in the fourth century. You know, why there were tens of thousands of people who went to the desert in Egypt and lived as monks and nuns because they felt the church had completely lost its way. And that they, you know, because there was no longer any negative price, in fact, it could be very profitable to be a Christian leader. And they were doing all this pagan stuff and dressing in fancy clothes and living in big houses. The monastic movement was a, a, a reaction against that. So I'm not suggesting that all the ways they've done it in the past were wrong. For instance, in the fourth century, what they were doing is they were taking the dominant cultural paradigms and they were, they were carrying them over into the church. Well, is contemporary Christian music not somewhat that same thing? And so I'm not, and, and, and I, again, it sounds like I'm being completely, I realize that as I'm going along, that I'm being completely critical of contemporary Christian worship, and I am not meaning to at all. I think that it is the most obvious example where we may have gone too far, and that we've allowed culture to influence us more than it should have, in the same way that they did in the fourth century, okay? That we have been too quick to take on the values, sort of the mall culture values, or the celebrity-driven culture values, or, you know, and we've lost the content. Oh, we've become superficial. And, and I can absolutely identify with that. Um, I guess three or four years ago, we went back to the States, and my family has land that's close to an area, uh, close to, in the Smoky Mountains, close to uh, Pigeon Forge and Gatlinburg. And in Pigeon Forge, it, you know, there's all of these... Uh, I used to have a girlfriend whose parents ran a restaurant in Pigeon Forge, so... Oh, okay. <laughs> so, you know, good eating, but uh, <laughs> um, lots of... That's where Dollywood uh, is, by the way. What do you call it? The shows? Like yeah. that, uh, celebrity shows, and lots of them are music. It's like a small Branson, Missouri. Yes, that's exactly what it is. And so we go to a church there, and I'm sitting in the church, and I, I mean, I'm just watching the production happen. <laughs> and, you know, I'm thinking anyone that couldn't make it down at the whatever, whoever's music hall has come here, and they're on stage because... It was like watching, you know, I should have paid to come in the door. And, and that was an example, I think, of you saying, you know, have we taken it too far? It was absolutely um, entertainment. Yep. And I think, I told you, when we went back to San Antonio and we went to the church and they had, they had contemporary Christian worship, that was very meaningful, very moving. That's one of the times that I was thinking, you know, if we could capture some of this. I think, I think I fail, in terms of leading worship, by not having to be a moving enough experience. And I'm not talking about just emotionalism, but that it take on another, a greater dimension for people than just an hour of listening to stuff and learning something and singing a few songs and remembering what they were like and then going home. You know, what can we do in our worship to make it bigger than that? And there are some things we can learn from contemporary Christian music um, developments. Oh, and I'm certainly not saying that, you know, all contemporary Christian is that way. It was just this right. particular yeah. uh, moment. It was like, oh, oh my. It's like at the Crystal Cathedral. They ended up losing their tax exempt status because they ended up having to charge because they spent so much money. Their Christmas play every year would have elephants and camels yes. and lions, real ones, yes. on stage. <laughs> Talk about a production, and they ended up, I mean, it was so expensive to put these things on, they started charging for them, and eventually they lost their tax exempt status. I don't know if they ever got back. They probably did. So, yeah, I mean, how big a production do you need to be? And how, at what point does the production value begin to overshadow the real presence of Christ? That's really the only question. And we can go, we can be just as wrong with a, too much of an addiction to only traditionalism. See, one of the things in our church that I'm very pleased about is... Given that we have two congregations that are very different, our English language congregation is older, they're more used to the traditional way, we introduce some kind of phrase stuff, but it's much more traditional service. But then our Spanish language congregation, which is younger, culturally very different, they have, I mean until recently, <laughs> we just had some problems, but they had drums and electric guitars and electric keyboard and, and you know, and, and they're rocking it. I mean, their worship was really going at it. I love the fact that we have both of those, and both of those congregations are part of our church. I mean, it, it's, they're equal parts of our church. Right? We are one church with two congregations, and the fact that because it's two different languages, then we can't just, you know, people can't just pick and choose what they want. But I'm very pleased that given the cultural differences and the age differences, that we're able to do that. Um, 
So, I've gone over. In the in next week and in the weeks ahead, we will begin to, now that we kind of tease things apart, we'll begin to look at putting things back together and hopefully together. As I say, I'm, I'm hoping and praying that I will grow a lot in terms of how to do this better. Uh, I don't think I'm a huge disaster at it, but how I can be better at it. So, let me pray. Father God, we're truly grateful again for your grace. We pray that you would teach us to worship you in spirit and in truth, as you have called us to. Teach us what that means in our own traditions, in our own place, in our own churches. That we can worship you with our whole hearts and selves, and that we can join with other brothers and sisters in doing that corporately. We commit ourselves to that and ask for your grace. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Thanks for being here, everybody.